Good evening, welcome to the program. And I should say from the outset, if you don't feel like watching us tonight, you can watch the Prime Minister, Tony Abbott. Right now, he is giving a speech you can watch on APAC Channel 648. He's just kicking off. It's a speech the 2014 Economic and Social Outlook Conference. It sounds fascinating. Otherwise, stick with us. <laughs> we'll do our best to keep you interested. This week, of course, marked the start of a new financial year and a new political landscape in the Senate. Many of these new faces on the Senate crossbench are there after winning just a teeny tiny percentage of the vote. Ricky Muir, the motoring enthusiast, won just half of 1% of the vote. But thanks to cleverly arranged preference deals, they're all there for another six years and they do have to be taken seriously by both sides of politics. In the coming weeks, they'll decide the fate of the carbon tax. In the coming months, they'll decide the fate of the first Abbott government budget. And in the years ahead, the entire Abbott government agenda, including any changes to border protection laws, anti-terror laws. The list goes on and on. To look at the new landscape and the big issues of this week tonight, we are joined by the Assistant Minister for Social Services, Senator Mitch Fifield, Nick Cater, the incoming head of the Menzies Research Centre, Cassandra Wilkinson from the Centre for Independent Studies, and Labor's Nick Champion, the Shadow Parliamentary Secretary for Health. Welcome to you all. Let's start with the, the, your new colleagues in, uh, in the Senate, Mitch Fifield. Do you think they all deserve to be there? Well, all senators uh, in the Australian Parliament have been duly elected according to our electoral processes and electoral law, mm -hmm. uh, and it's incumbent upon us to respect that fact. Uh, we're going to treat uh, all our colleagues with uh, courtesy and respect, uh, but uh, in return, uh, we expect that they will uh, respect the mandate that we that, have. Does that electoral law need change, given, as I say, the small percentage of the vote some of these uh, new faces uh, got there on. Your uh, colleague, Tony Smith, only months ago chaired a parliamentary committee that uh, suggested a number of changes, including uh, the idea of optional preferential voting in the Senate so that voters could just put one in the box rather than having to number uh, exhaust all their preferences. Now that would go a long way to um, preventing these micro parties getting up. Do you like that idea? Well, in the ordinary course of events after every election, the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters conducts mm. a review uh, of the conduct of the election. Uh, that's happening. Uh, Tony Smith has presented his interim report. Uh, there'll be a final report uh, and government will respond. So do you like what he suggested? Well, uh, government will respond to uh, the recommendations of the report, but uh, what we're focused on, what I'm focused on as manager of government business in the Senate uh, is the repeal of the carbon tax, the repeal of the carbon tax. I know, I know, I know, I know um, that, that, but I'm just wondering that, that's, whether that's you That's what we're focused on. I, I appreciate that, but I'm just wondering whether you do have a view on, on this. Well, I think it's a good practice that there is uh, always a review uh, by the Joint Standing Committee after every election. Sure. Uh, and we'll see what the final recommendations are. But should there are. be reform to stop micro-parties uh, gaming the system? Well, we'll wait for the final report uh, okay. and then government will respond. As a, as a minister, I don't have an independent uh, electoral uh, policy. Uh, it's a matter that government will consider right. as a whole. Uh, Nick Champion, let me ask you then. What, what do you think about this idea? And the other one that uh, came out of that report, that to register a party, you need 1,500 unique members, not just 500 who could also be the members of 10 other parties with different names that all sound catchy. Do you like these reforms? Well, look, I think they're sensible and they're well thought out, and I think the committee's done a good job. Obviously, both the government and the opposition have to consider them carefully, and uh, indeed the rest, of the, the rest of the country, the rest of the legislators. Um, look, I'm personally concerned that the Senate often looks like a bit of a circus, and um, uh, I'm personally concerned that, just uh, like the the, <laughs> that sometimes elections look a lot like people entering a lottery. So in that respect I'm you know, I'm concerned by that. Um, the Labor Party I think is like the government waiting to respond to the, the sensible recommendations of the a, committee. Let me ask you both then for a frank answer on this. Is there any chance these reforms will see the light of day while you need, and I'm talking about both sides, you need the likes of Clive Palmer and these other minor party senators? Well, I, I think there's always a, lot, a, a, a prospect of a sensible reforms passing both houses and parliament. Nick Xenophon, I think, is on the record of saying that some of these reforms are sensible. He's an independent that's been elected with a very uh, healthy vote. With a very healthy very vote, healthy so he vote. and he proves that, uh, as Brian Harradine proved, mm. that uh, independents can get elected when they've got the support of the public. Yeah, and so, he, he did. And I think that's a critical thing here. He did go from yeah. a very small vote first time around mm. to uh, now a very healthy one. Uh, Cass, let me ask you, what do you think about these sort of reform ideas? 
ideas? Well, I think generally oligopolies are not good for consumers, and that's just mm. as true in politics as it is in supermarkets or airlines. And I think you need to be a little bit concerned when the people who are the most recent winners get to make the rules about who competes with them next time. And I think that having worked with a lot of independents in New South Wales during my years as a political advisor, that quite often the independents turn out to be better people than everyone thinks Expects it's fun to, to speculate yeah. that they are at the beginning. Um, and I guess the thing too is that the people use expressions like you just have gaming the system. Preferences is only gaming for micro parties to the same extent that that last spot on every ticket of a major party is also being to the same extent gamed through preferences as well. So, I mean, the rules are the rules. These yeah, guys won. And they've won fair and square on the rules. And chances are stand. that you'll find that they're not as stupid as they're being painted at, no, I, look, as I at the moment. Who I, knows? I think you know if they if they have good advice, know what they're doing, they they could be very refreshing in the Senate in some ways. But Nick Cater. Is, is there something wrong with the system when you, you can get in on such a tiny vote? Well, clearly you could have a better system. I think um, you're not going to find the perfect system, though. So whether you just want to throw it out and just, just mm. uh, come in with, with something fresh is a difficult thing to do. And, and this particular parliament, very, very difficult because, of course, as we've seen listening to these two gentlemen mm. here, nobody really wants to take on the minor parties mm. at this right stage. Now, no. yeah. <laughs> That's right. But on the other hand, I, you know, I fully agree with Cass. I think what we've ended up with, in a sense, is a representative Senate in that, that there seems to be a large vote out there for none of the above and that's certainly what we Well something like 25% of Australians at uh, the, the last year's election didn't vote for the two major parties so there's clearly an appetite out there for, for different faces, different voices. Well, it in certainly the doesn't, I can tell you when you're on the campaign trail it certainly doesn't feel like you're part of an oligopoly. Or, or oligopoly. <laughs> you know, it, that's the last way it feels, it feels like a very competitive uh, dynamic dom democracy to me. Yeah. But we, we do have to give the new Senate a go. Uh, we we do have to give the, the new senators a, a chance uh, <coughs> and uh, I think senators of goodwill uh, from different perspectives uh, can make this a workable Senate. Well, the first cab off the rank really is the carbon tax and it does look like that will be repealed in the coming weeks. But then the budget, it looks like you're facing a pretty tough battle even with this new Senate, which is supposed to be more your way than the, than the old one dominated by Labor and the Greens. They don't like much of what you've put up. Do you think it's, the government will have to give more ground in uh, trying to negotiate this through? Well, you, you're either a legislative optimist or you're a legislative pessimist. And as manager of Senate business, uh, I'm a legislative you're a optimist. Glass half kind of guy. Um, but look, it's hard to, to predict uh, how the Senate will, will function until it's actually there and happening. Um, just think back to uh, under the Howard government when we were seeking to introduce the goods and services tax and the new tax system. Uh, no one gave us a chance, but uh, we got there, um, of all people, with the Australian Democrats uh, when we were uh, partially privatising Telstra. Um, who'd have thought we'd have got there, but we got there with the help of uh, Brian Harradine. So um, you can't really know what the outcome will be uh, until the Senate is there. I think when you've got eight uh, unique individuals, um, uh, Senate magic can happen. Nick, do you, do you think it is predictable where some of these crossbenches are going to go on some of these, well, particularly budget measures? I mean, Palmer and his senators really don't like a lot of what's been put up. No, but on the other hand, I think, you know, the lesson from last week with the, uh, you know, Palmer's announcement on, mm. on uh, carbon policy is that it's entirely unpredictable. I mean, I think what this is going to do is it's going to have to make, the government is going to have to work very hard to make the common sense clear case why something's good policy. And I always think that's a very good thing anyway, that they, that they should have to, to do that, you know, that not just talk in political or bureaucratic speak. We're going to have to actually explain very simply why it's in people's interest to vote for this. Uh, and so painful as that is, difficult as it'll be, some measures won't get through. I think overall it's good for democracy. And in a sense, this is business as usual in the Senate. I mean, the House of Representatives very rudely took the attention away from the Senate <laughs> in the last Parliament. So uh, this is uh, regular transmission being resumed to some extent. Uh, it's not usually the case that the government of the day uh, has, a, has a, a straightforward time in the Senate. Uh, you've almost well, always got to negotiate. It, it's far from straightforward uh, at the moment. Cass, do you think there is much chance for most of these budget measures? Oh, absolutely. I mean, and if certainly not all of them, but the ones that matter most to the government will get through because 
There's no point being an independent. There's definitely no point holding the balance of power, if not to make a deal. I mean, that is what Meg Lee's showed. Um, and years of working with independents myself, this and is their Harrogate, time to shine. Yeah. They want to make a deal. It's just a question of which one. Um, speaking of Clive Palmer, I want to also ask about uh, the allegations that surround his business dealings. And, and the Australian newspaper in particular has been very doggedly pursuing this. Uh, and yet both major parties do seem somewhat Somewhat reluctant to uh, criticise him, suggest that there needs to be, you know, answers given on all of this, and, and we're talking here specifically about the allegation that $12 million of Chinese money that was meant to be for looking after a port in Western Australia was actually used for his election expenses. Now, he denies it. Uh, nonetheless, uh, Nick, what, what do you think about this, and is there enough attention on this, not just from the media, but from the, the parties. I wouldn't expect the parties to get into this at this stage, but, um, you know, Clive Palmer's been very clever at trying to portray this as an ag agenda by the Australian, but, I mean, what, what, what the Australians picked on, what Hedley Thomas has found, are court documents, that's what he's working from, from a court case, and on the surface, on the face of it, it looks like Clive Palmer is in serious trouble if, if these allegations uh, turn out to be true, uh, and the documentary evidence is there. I mean, you've, you've seen the reports. There's chapter and verse. There are emails, documents, details of this. So it's a, it is a big problem for Clive Palmer, a big problem in his, for his business and a big problem for him as a politician. But you say, you say it's not yet time for the parties uh, to get involved. But we, we did see in the, in the previous parliament when there were allegations against members like Peter Slipper, and you know, very different things, obviously. But a lot of political pressure came, uh, was brought to bear. Yeah, but I mean, arguably, and I think everybody would agree that very often it's a mistake to jump in when a, when a, when a court process is going ahead and, and uh, you know, we can look back perhaps with hindsight on the Peter Slipper affair and, and say perhaps there was too much of that going on. So, uh, for whatever reason, both sides are holding back and I don't think that's a bad thing at this stage. Uh, Nick Champion, I see you nodding at that. You, you're well, not keen to... uh, I think that's <laughs> true of, uh, of the last few years in public life. Um, we have seen sometimes hysteria around certain individuals rather than um, giving them their day in court uh, and the like, you know, I'm not saying that about any particular individual mm -hmm. but just about this circumstance in public life and I, I do think it's something new in Australian public life and I don't think it's actually very good for our body politic. We should be talking about uh, the issues in front of us, the policy choices before the nation, they're the important things uh, I think. But surely it matters how someone got there and, and whether they uh, have been honourable in their profession prior to entering Parliament? Well, well, that's true to an extent, but in my view, it's the issues. If you go and do a shopping centre stall uh, in Elizabeth or in Victoria or WA, you won't get too many questions about personalities. You'll get an awful lot of discussion about issues. Uh, and I think there's a real thirst out there in the public uh, for uh, talking about issues rather than personalities, rather than, um, you know, some of these extraneous issues. Do you, well, Cass, do you agree that uh, it should just be issues, personalities and personal allegations against someone like Clive Palmer should be left to one side? Well, I think there's enough rich material in his policy uh, platform to get stuck into while the courts do their job. I mean, there has been far too much of getting out the rope and wagons before the courts have made a decision in recent years, and it'd be really nice if people calmed down and waited till there was a conviction before they decide to hang people these days. Well, I'm sure that's true, but uh, on the other hand, uh, it is the media's job as well, isn't it, to uh, investigate this stuff, well, expose this stuff. I think the job of investigative journalists to go after those stories, I mean, we've seen in New South Wales, New South Wales owes a debt to Kate McClymont and the team at the Herald, absolutely, mm. and I think that the journalists going after these jobs should do their, do their job and chase those stories, for sure. I just think that the rest of us who watch with interest should shut up till there's a decision in a court. Mitch Fifield. Oh, look, the journalists should do their job, the Australian Electoral Commission should do their job uh, and the, the rest of us in public life should get on and focus on the people's business which we'll be trying to do uh, next week in the so Senate. So you don't have any particular concerns about what Clive Palmer's done in business? 
Well, we have uh, appropriate authorities uh, whose job it is in the case of electoral law uh, to e examine uh, uh, accusations and to make sure that the electoral law has been followed, so we should leave that to them. All right, and look, before we leave uh, this whole issue of the, of the new Senate, are you 100% confident the carbon tax will be gone in the next couple of weeks? Uh, in the Senate, you're only 100% confident uh, once uh, the division bells have rung, the votes have been tallied and it's been called in your favour. Uh, but uh, we're optimistic because uh, the, the overwhelming majority of crossbench senators uh, ran on platforms uh, to abolish the carbon tax. So I'd fully expect that they would be consistent with the policies that they took to the people. But you need the Palmer United Party senators to do this. They're demanding that guarantee that price reductions be passed on. Is that going to happen? Well, we already have in the legislation uh, the capacity for the ACCC uh, to make sure that, uh, that price savings are passed on. Uh, we've got given additional money to the ACCC for that. Uh, and look, if, if there's more that can be done to reinforce that, then sure, we'll, we'll take a look at that. Nick Champion, are you going to shed too many tears seeing the carbon tax go? Well, look, I think what the government's doing is, and you can see this on the renewable energy target now, is running headlong from all the efficient measures to deal with climate change and running to uh, direct action, which we know um, is just a boondoggle. So um, you've really got to question um, the government's common sense, you know, in their determination to go down this route. And they'll leave us slowly but surely as an international pariah in this area. Well, you mentioned the renewable energy target. There has been a few suggestions on this, and one coming from the coalition backbench in particular, that aluminium smelters be exempt from this target because it's costing them millions. Are you sympathetic to that position? Well, look, this is a Howard government scheme, mm -hmm. and it's one that the Liberal Party voted for in 2008, 2009, when it came up the last time. I'm just surprised that we now have this ginger group in the Liberal Party basically you know, again, pushing towards or pushing away from efficient measures to deal with climate change uh, and really a adopting what is a very old-fashioned approach. OK, but just to be um, clear, you're, and, you're, you're and, happy and, for I've got smelters to keep paying. Well, yeah, that's right. I think, I think it's a good scheme, it's a good program, it's been working very well. And while people talk about jobs in certain sectors, they don't talk about the guy in uh, the Clare Hotel who I met who works on a wind farm doing maintenance. You know, in South Australia, uh, there was a chart up on, on Twitter, you know, which showed that the majority of, of power coming out of South Australia was actually wind power and coal had sort of sunk away. So, it, it, you know, there are jobs in renewable energy as well. It's just the government's not choosing to focus on them. <coughs> well, the, the issue here, and it is um, a slightly complicated one, because the, the renewable energy target initially 20% renewables by 2020, sounds good. For certainty reasons, that was then changed to an estimation that it's going to mean 45,000 gigawatts uh, of renewables by 2020, and that was set in stone in, in the legislation. Since then, energy use has actually dropped, and that 45,000 is actually going to be 27% uh, of, of our total energy use by 2020. So there's a few ideas here. You either go back to a 20% target, um, you exempt some things like aluminium smelters, um, Cass, or, or you stick with what we got. Well, I, I guess the thing is, it's kind of ironic the sides that people are taking, given that it took Labor a long time to get from solar feed-in tariffs and cash for clunkers and what were essentially direct action measures to a proper market mechanism, which was a carbon tax. <coughs> um, and now we have the pro-market side of politics taking us back to essentially an industry policy approach again, which Treasury have said is essentially a much more expensive way of solving the same problem. Mm -hmm. and market distorting way of solving the same problem. I think Howard, back when the ETS deal um, was available, probably had it right that you want to do a low touch market based approach of some kind. Carbon tax was pretty much the same thing. Mm. I, I, I don't understand why we'd spend more doing something less efficient. Um, because this renewable energy target, uh, Nick Cater, isn't the most efficient way of cutting emissions. Is it? No, and I disagree with Nick here. I mean, Nick said it was an efficient way. It's certainly not. It's, it's, it's a way that picks winners. It's a way that gives uh, massive subsidies to various uh, technologies and various producers. A lot of people are making a lot of money. I know what Nick's like saying about South guys. Australia. I've been to Port Piri recently and the dock is piled high with these windmills. Uh, now, we all know that they're, they're very expensive. Uh, they're, they're 
they only work when the wind is going. They are not the silver bullet on all this. There's perhaps more uh, arguments in favour of solar power, but even there, you're having to have massive cross subsidies and things to, to make them work. So it's not efficient. It is problematic. And I do feel, I, I, I don't see that you can really exempt the aluminium industry, but I see what Jackie Lambie is saying. I mean, Tasmania already has 80% renewable energy, thanks to the far-sighted policies of putting hydroelectric mm. dams in in, in in the 70s. Um, and, 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 you know, they're not allowed to, to reap the benefit of that. So, you know, I think the whole thing is, is, is difficult, and, uh, and the government's got a review coming up to this, and, and let's hope that they'll come up with some sensible proposals for moderating it. Well, Mitch Firefield, do you have sympathy with uh, some of your, many of your colleagues who do want change on this? Well, I, I think uh, ginger groups are actually a sign of a healthy party room. I know Nick uh, was uh, saying that a ginger group is an indication that somehow things are out of control, but uh, I, th I think ginger groups are good. Uh, it means that uh, discussion and debate in the party room is, is alive it, it and well. It did seem this issue this week very deliberate, coordinated, almost as if those at the top don't actually mind this message getting out there that we need to change well, the renewable energy to target. Dan Tan is, is a very thoughtful contributor, so uh, I'm not surprised that uh, it was a very uh, measured uh, mm. contribution that, that he made to the public debate. But we have a legislated review. Uh, what is the point of having a review uh, if government isn't going to have an open mind, uh, if government isn't going to... Uh, ask itself the question, uh, is the renewable energy target uh, being applied uh, in the most sensible way possible? I mean, we don't want to unnecessarily penalise but you won't change it. you won't change it this term, will you? Well, there, there will be a renewable energy target. That we've got the 20% target. Uh, but whether that, there are any adjustments to that, uh, well, that's, that's a matter that will be considered what about in the wake of the review. For, what about certainty for industry, though? That's important too, isn't it? Yeah, and one of the, the terms of reference for the review was that uh, uh, they take into account sovereign risk. Uh, so uh, we're not going to do anything that's uh, precipitous. Uh, we're not going to do anything to, uh, to scare the horses. Uh, but it's appropriate to take a, a careful look. Uh, and uh, I welcome the fact that uh, we have colleagues in our party room who are making thoughtful contributions. We'll take a break. I want to turn then to uh, asylum seekers. Um, a lot of mystery still about what's going on on the high seas of the Indian Ocean. We'll discuss that. question your decisions when you're young but some of them turn out to be your best like starting your super with rest and about one in six working australians are with us today rest industry super good better rest making energy is a lot like making bread or milk it's made every day storing it can be tricky so you have to estimate how much you think people will need and make or buy just the right amount at Origin, we're not one of those companies that just sells energy. We make energy fresh every day. get a new phone. You want to download all the apps you need and rock some new tunes. That's why Telstra's giving you extra data to get set up. 25 gigs to use in Australia for the first month on selected new mobile plans. Because at Telstra, we care about your peace of mind. And we want to be famous for it. You need a great website. Why not do it yourself? Make your images look stunning in any of our amazing galleries. Create your stunning website today. Go to Wix.com. It's easy and free. Sometimes our spirit of adventure can be hard to realize. But what if there was a vehicle that could unlock your inner adventurer, but also show you the way home? One that takes you to the edge of your seat, albeit one stitched in leather. One with a nine-speed transmission for better fuel economy and a smoother ride. One with five-star safety, so you feel secure in places completely unknown. 
the 2014 Jeep Cherokee. Pretend no more. If you fall ill, wherever you are in the world, we'll help find a doctor who speaks your language. All part of the Just What the Doctor Ordered service we deliver daily. American Express. Realise the potential. The accidental senators, the mining magnate, his party and their parliament. Is Australian politics broken? Plus Nadal nicked off at Wimbledon and reality TV's surprising gift to the nation. Join me this week for Friday Live on Sky News. Good to have you with us tonight. We're talking to Senator Mitch Fifield, the Assistant Social Services Minister. Nick Cater from the Menzies Research Centre, Cassandra Wilkinson from the Centre for Independent Studies and Labor's Nick Champion, the Shadow Parliamentary Secretary for Health. I want to turn to uh, asylum seekers and a lot of reports this week about two boats from Sri Lanka carrying between them some 200 asylum seekers came very close to about 300 kilometres from Christmas Island, uh, ran into trouble an Australian customs vessel has now had them transferred on board. From there, it's a little unclear what's actually happened. Uh, none of this is being confirmed by the government. It's an on-water operation, and for that reason, secrecy prevails. There have been suggestions the Sri Lankan Navy would then collect them at sea, take them back home. Uh, the Sri Lankan High Commissioner told me this afternoon, no, there's no Sri Lankan Navy vessel involved here. Now, Mitch Fifield, do you know any more than we do about this as, as, a, as a minister? Is, is there any private briefing for you? Well, it, it's not in my uh, portfolio area, um, but our policy, is, as you know, uh, is that uh, we don't comment on, uh, on water operations, and there's good reason for that. Uh, we as a government don't want to provide any information that could in any way, shape or form uh, assist people smugglers uh, to uh, moderate or change their business in some way. We don't want to do anything that could possibly give people just, smugglers Just talk me through this. Even if you didn't give all the details mm. and you just said <clears throat> we are... Australia is uh, in custody of asylum seekers and we're taking them back to Sri Lanka. How is that going to help people smugglers? Well, let's, let's look at the scoreboard. Um, no successful people smuggling operations in the last six months. We all know that 50,000 people uh, came uh, under the previous government, uh, courtesy of people smugglers. Um, we've got a formula. Uh, we've got a range of policies that together are working. Uh, so we don't want to put that at risk. Uh, we think an important part uh, is the fact that we do keep information tight, that we don't comment on, on water operational matters. Um, what frustrates the Labor Party is the fact that our policies are actually working. The only criticism that they can seek to we'll, make we'll is, to is, is, is why, is why we'll doesn't, Scott, doesn't Scott Morrison provide a shipping news every yeah, yeah. day? No, that's, but, that's, uh, their, uh, that's their big okay. killer point but as you know, about a lot our of, policies. Sure. But a lot of people do have questions about whether uh, Australia is breaching international conventions uh, and exactly what is happening with the lives of these people at sea. Yep. And this is all being done by the government in our name. Do they deserve, do Australians deserve a bit more information on this? Well, we are honouring our, our international obligations uh, and we won't do anything that puts people in harm's way. And Scott Morrison has made very clear uh, that, that if there is a significant event on water, such as a medical evacuation uh, or there have been issues of, uh, of safety or life mm. at sea, uh, that he will immediately <coughs> comment on those. So, yeah, but, okay. so you put that to one side and you're left with uh, operational activities, which I think uh, for good reason we have a policy that we won't comment on <coughs> and also the operational commander, uh, that's also his policy. Sure, but those assurances, you're essentially asking everyone to take you on trust. Nick Champion, do you trust those assurances? Well, look, I think the concern is here. In every other, most other areas of public life, we have uh, a, a basic level of transparency, um, not for the Labor Party, but for uh, journalists, for the Australian public, and that um, is the bedrock of our democracy and trust in government. And the real concern is here is not some political point, but just a basic you know, bedrock of our democracy, that transparency is good for government, and when you don't have transparency, um, uh, then you inevitably have issues, I think. Um, so that's the first point I make, and I make it in a, uh, not in a partisan sense, but I think it's just better that we do it that way. And there are many defence issues where we have more information than we do in, in the area of border protection. So I, I just think that that is a legitimate concern. It shouldn't be dismissed by the government. Well, I mean, um, just on the defence thing, I mean, we, but when, when it's an operational matter, though, it's, it's yes, not disclosed the, until after. That's right, until after. But 
you do get the information. And the point is here is that um, because the government wants to make uh, this pretty cheap political point, and it's a cheap political point, Considering uh, they opposed the Malaysian transfer agreement, they opposed just about every measure. What's we took the cheap used, political point? Used, uh, well, well, they keep on making this point. Oh, 50,000 people lead with came chin, here. Nick. All of this sort of stuff. When they frustrated the previous government's attempts to deal with this issue, and when and when we and when the Rudd government and when the, uh, well, and when the Rudd That's government had to put, a put it back in place, you yeah, came after along. You, demolished you came it. along. After you demolished of, it. No, no. But you came along, got into government shortly afterwards, and claimed you know claimed success. Well. I what think was it's success, cheap. wasn't it? Well, well, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, what was, but, yeah. but the point is, it, the fundamental was the fundamental thing was offshore processing, wasn't it? Which was done by the but right you, government. Let me ask you, and you, that's, what's you, under, that's what's underpinned. You, you opposed that's that's the last time you're in opposition, and the, the very first thing you well, did well, was but, to dismantle well, offshore well, you, processing. You, you opposed the Malaysian transfer. Agreement let me ask you and now. And voted with the Greens in Parliament. Let me ask you now because there weren't the human rights protections in Malaysia. Let me ask you this though: What would Labor and at the same time what would you do? What would Labor do if it was in government? Government today, if some 200 asylum seekers from Sri Lanka came very close to Christmas, well, look, what would you do? What we've set out is we would have a basic level of transparency. We have offshore processing, and that was working. Okay, what that's, would you do with the, these boats? The, what would you do with them? Well, uh, clearly, that's a matter for offshore processing, isn't it? You can't, I don't, you, I don't you, understand you, you, the, you the policy uh, position now. I know what is Labor's policy government. position now that they would be brought to Christmas Island and then transferred to. Manus Island. Well, that's, that's my understanding of things, because the issue... So they would not be turned back in any way? Well, I think the issue in terms of Sri Lanka is, if, if these boats are, are having... have got Tamils on them, uh, there are issues with re human rights issues with uh, returning them to okay, those circumstances. So they would, they would be brought to Christmas Island. And, and let's not forget, they've come from India. Oh, I, want to, yeah, I want to talk so about that, but I just want to clear this up I mean, first. I know, well, they would be brought to Christmas Island. Well, they would, they, would be, they would be dealt with through the offshore processing But that situation. would mean bringing them to Christmas Island and then processing well, presumably their so, claims. Yes. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, so. I can see what would happen if Labor got back in government. They'll get back in government. There won't be any boats that have arrived. Labor will say, look, we're always very uncomfortable with offshore processing. Uh, they'll dismantle offshore processing. They'll say, we're not going to do that well, anymore. The boats will come. Well, we'll, be back, we'll be back where we Cass, were in 2000. You, you what, speculate what, what do you when, think Cass no, should the happen best predictor of future behaviour in this past situation? Past what would be the ideal approach? Well, I think that we lose sight of the real problem, which is that 100 million people are sitting around the world in camps, that many more people live in countries that are not worth living in, and that the big problem that wealthy, free countries have is how to embrace population growth in a way that eases those pressures globally. At the moment, we have both major political parties attempting to claim success for doing the best job of doing absolutely nothing. I mean, they're doing the best job of keeping people out. Mm. I think that the so, brave but in and a interesting practical thing sense, to that, do that would is mean to address what? how to let people in. And, and uh, so these 200, uh, you'd, you'd process at Christmas Island and then bring into the country. Because we're we're working on the premise at the moment that people coming is a bad thing, that there should be an agreed limit. And I stress at this point, this is my private views, I'm not speaking for my yeah. employer or anybody else yeah. in this circumstance, but I think that we have a problem, the scale of which is not being grasped by either side of politics, and that is that there are too many countries in the world that are dictatorships, that are in conflict, that are just places where a human being cannot pursue a life. There's no doubt about that. But w when, of course, this policy that you're articulating was essentially in place under the Rudd government, oh, Mark no, one. no, 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 not at all. I'm not supporting a Rudd government policy. I'm supporting the kind of policy that involves erecting a Statue of Liberty on Christmas Island and saying, bring us your huddled masses. I mean, I would love to see Australia but does that then become new America. Does that become the magnet for everyone in this region who's in the situation you, you describe heading for that that statue and of liberty. Speaking only for myself, self, I would love to see that day. I would like to see Australia grow into a grand superpower on the American scale based on accepting people who want to make a great life here because they've fled a terrible life somewhere else. Mm. America became the greatest country in the world off the back of accepting people who needed help instead of turning them away. Now you can call that naive, but I look at America and that looks like success to me. Nick Cater, what do you think should happen? Look, I understand Cassie's arguments, and I could, but I, it, to, to go that route would be to overturn basically, you know, 100 years of policy. I mean, Australia has never had that sort of approach to immigration. It's always been a selective 
system. Uh, and I think it's very... I, I take exception to Nick's point that this is a cheap political point. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's actually important to make it very clear that there have been no arrivals on shore and that nobody has got any advantage by coming by boat. That's the message that has to get out uh, to try and limit this trade or put a stop to it. And of course, there's always going to be... the, the These are entrepreneurs, let's face it, driving this trade in, in people. And they're always going to try and find a new way of doing it. And plainly, it looks like they've had a go here. But and, isn't it a blow to their trade to have the government saying, we identified a couple of boats, now they're going back? Well, it is a blow to their trade, but you have to keep that tough stance. And I think Nick's sort of equivocation on this, the idea that, oh, maybe they've got a case, maybe we should process them, that's when you start getting problems. Um, I do agree with Cass. I mean, we do have an international obligation to, uh, to uh, look after refugees. We have a, a quota, which, uh, which is a fairly generous one. Some people think it should be larger. But uh, if you look around the world, I mean, I think the sort of places you'd be looking for real hardship and real suffering uh, is probably the Middle East at the moment, perhaps even Crimea, I don't know. But, but uh, you know, I think we have to take a hard-headed look at this because we can't take all... Well, let's talk about Sri Lanka then, because there are plenty of places in the world that, uh, you know, uh, uh, simply awful right now. But should we be sending people back to Sri Lanka? The Prime Minister today said it's um, a country at peace after what was a very long-running and bloody civil war. Uh, Nick Champion, do you think... It is a country at peace. Do you think Tamils are safe there? Well, look, a core part of the Refugee Convention is not returning people to... Uh, persecution. Persecution danger. Um, and you can't make a blanket decision about that um, because everybody's claim is individual and separate. So it would seem to me that we have to be very careful about those issues. Very careful. As a nation... Um, and I don't think that you can make blanket assumptions uh, about these situations. Well, uh, Mitch Pfeiffer, what's your sense of it? I mean, uh, how much confidence do you have that, that Sri Lanka has moved on, that Tamils aren't facing persecution? Well, I mean, in what I say, I, I'm not speculating at all as to what may or may not be happening sure. um, in, in operational matters. But um, th there is no doubt that uh, Sri Lanka, uh, the situation has, has improved uh, dramatically. Um, uh, there is a reconciliation process uh, happening there. Um, uh, the situation in Sri Lanka isn't perfect, but, but things have, have improved greatly, uh, and it's important to acknowledge that, as the Prime Minister has today. But the Sri Lankan government has resisted uh, efforts to have... Uh, uh, proper international inquiry into the war crimes that took place there during that civil war. They flat out deny any um, persecution is going on, any uh, Tamils being displaced, beaten, intimidated. Do you, do you believe that it's absolutely fine? Oh, and I, I haven't said that. The, you know, the perfection hasn't been reached in, in, in Sri Lanka. But the Australian government has, uh, has taken the position that we, we want to work with Sri Lanka, we want to encourage Sri Lanka um, to, uh, to be their, their best selves. And Nick Cater, uh, uh, look, you know, this is difficult. It's not. It's not. Uh, you, you, I think the way it's being portrayed that the Tamils are an oppressed minority. It's very difficult to make that case. I mean, let's not forget that the Tamils were the ones that really pioneered suicide bombing. It was a very brutal and nasty civil war with atrocities on both sides. It's going to take a long while, I think, for that society to mend. But I think the best thing we can do is encourage and help that through the Commonwealth, through other organisations, through our direct, direct connections, rather than sort of condemn them and say, look, you know, you're, I think we, we really have to encourage uh, uh, the, the, the growth of a proper civil society in that country. And I think they have come an enormous mm. long way on that. And, and, and our job, I think, should surely be to uh, encourage them in that right direction. Yeah, I mean, Cass, any civil war is going to take a long time uh, for forgiveness and healing to happen. Yeah, I, I do think, I mean, Nick is correct that once you start deciding who you do take in a refugee program you have to make some terrible choices between bad places worse places and intolerable places and probably the most intolerable places at the moment are in Africa and in the Middle East and the one of the things that frustrates me is that now that the 
flow of people through the people smuggling trade in the oceans, which was apparently what everybody wanted to stop, has been ostensibly stopped. Um, if we were supposedly stopping the boats so that we could have an orderly arrival and take more refugees through proper channels, it would be really great if we could start taking more through proper channels. And if we increase the number of people coming from UN camps, I think that would be the kind of gesture that would make a lot of people in the community like me who think that this seems like keeping people out rather than improving the system would give us some faith that it's humane and not just nasty. Before we leave this issue, um, I, I just want to touch on a report uh, that's come out tonight uh, on The Guardian. Uh, this is in relation to the 20 or 30,000 asylum seekers in the Australian community that the, the government doesn't want to give permanent visas to, permanent refugee visas, um, and has been trying to find a way to bring back temporary protection visas. The High Court keeps uh, knocking back its uh, various efforts. The latest attempt is apparently uh, allowing the Immigration Minister, Scott Morrison, to um, to cancel a permanent visa on the grounds of national security. But giving a permanent visa is not good for Australia's national security because it encourages more to try and come here. Is that, uh, is that going to be a successful way to have temporary visas? Well, back. I haven't caught up with the, with the, with the Guardian's uh, latest uh, piece of work, but uh, I mean, one of the things that we were trying to do uh, in bringing back temporary protection visas was to allow um, individuals the opportunity to, to do work. Um, the, the previous government uh, put people in the, in the situation where they were here, but unable to work. Yeah, I mean, that, permanent that's, visa they could still work. Yeah, that, that, that's, not good. that's not good for anyone. Um, so we, we are still of the view that uh, temporary protection visas uh, are an important uh, element uh, of uh, our overall policy. We'd, li we'd like to have them back. Um, uh, really the way to look at them is their safe haven visas. Uh, it, it's a visa to provide a safe haven for someone until such time as uh, they, they can return to uh, where they're from, uh, mm. where circumstances have improved. I think the concept of a safe haven visa is a good thing. How many people returned under the Howard government? How many TPV returned? You, you, you tell me. You oh, tell me. It was hardly you tell me. It was hardly but, any. It was about ten percent, I reckon. But people. Don't but quote people, me on that. No, but, but it was, it was but, not. It was nowhere no, near. Uh, but but people. But the, fa but the fact is that people did, and it's a good concept to have a safe haven visa. But you would admit that um, when you say safe haven, you're giving the public an, an, an impression that these people will be here for a while and then they'll return. Whereas that's not the practical outcome of those that policy, is it? No, the majority of them will stay in Australia. Uh, well, some, some, some will. They'll some work, might. they'll have families, they'll buy homes. Nick Cady, do you think the temporary visas are that important? I, I, I must admit, one of the things I was most troubled about from the Labor period was the idea of allowing people to settle in the community but not allow them to work. Mm. It seemed to me that was the first uh, cohort of immigrants in this nation's history that we've said we don't want you to work. That to me went against the grain so in that sense temporary protection visas have an advantage uh, over that and as to Nick's point about um, people returning well if, if they come and they work hard and they become decent members of the community then we want those people um, but what we want to stop of course is, is irregular arrivals or people electing to come here and, and that's a separate they thing have been stopped yeah. for the last six months I mean yeah. you, 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 the, the problem with the temporary visa was always that it created such uncertainty um, stress and you know social dysfunction for those who were stuck on them uh, when as, as Nick Champion points out they end up staying here anyway oh no, not, 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 not all um, and, and and the point is that you, you've never ever really completely won the battle against the people smugglers you, you need a, a range of, of tools uh, to destroy their business model um, and that I always found that the ironic thing about Labor talking about yeah we want to bust the people smugglers business model given the fact that they actually designed it for them when they abolished the offshore processing and abolished temporary protection visas so you need a, a number of elements uh, because uh, you want to make sure that the people smuggler business doesn't come back. How do you view these? I think that everyone at the table should have a look at Robin de Crespigny's book The People Smuggler which is told first person from the perspective of someone who's currently in an Australian jail who organised people smuggling and there are places in the world where the only hope you have of getting away from Saddam Hussein or whoever your local dictator is is through unofficial tra channels and some people smugglers fall into that business because the official queue 
is not available, it's not accessible, it's not moving. Um, you know, these channels exist because of market failure, because the free movement of people is so restricted on this planet that the unofficial channels have become quite lucrative. Now, you can talk about smashing their model because you don't like criminals, sure, but please don't do it at the same time as you're not doing anything to help the official queue move a little faster. Well, we're going to take a break. The more pressing uh, issue and concern for the government, it seems at the moment, is trying to stop uh, not so much asylum seekers, but potential terrorists coming back into the country. We'll look at that. The trouble with big banks... ..is you never talk to the same person twice. But at BOQ, you can talk to one person who really gets to know you. It's possible to love a bank. Let us prove it. Save at Australia's biggest stock take sale with 50% off selected full-price Van Heusen business shirts and 30% off full-price men's suits. Exclusions apply and cannot be used with other offers and Sunday, July 27. Meet Robert Potter. He designs mountain bike trails that take riders deep into the Tasmanian wilderness. It's the kind of terrain that really tests his Ford Ranger. What drives him to create these roller coasters of dirt? He wants us to see just how great the outdoors can be. The Ford Ranger is made for people like Robert. People who proceed with purpose. our card members are saying yes to faster rewards. Last year, we helped them enjoy over 14 million great experiences. Just part of the more rewarding service we deliver daily. American Express. Realise the potential. Jeep Cherokee is the most stylish, most striking Cherokee ever. But beneath its sleek styling lies true Jeep capability. To prove it, we'll be selling 10 Cherokees at just 10 grand each. But only if you can get here. To the world's most remote dealership. Start the adventure at jeep.com.au. Tonight on Paul Murray Live, who do you think is winner and loser of the week? Tell us at facebook.com forward slash Paul Murray Live. How did it go between Ricky Muir and the PM today? And what have real life Russians done to this fake American politician? I have no intention of working out a compromise. See you tonight. I want to turn to the uh, the issue that's been gripping the, the government's attention and everyone's attention really in the last few weeks, uh, the very disturbing events in Iraq and the number of Australians involved in the fight there with uh, what they're now calling themselves Islamic State. Uh, around 60 Australians involved in fighting with them and a total of 150 involved in supporting them. The Attorney General George Brandis this week met with about half a dozen Islamic leaders uh, in Canberra. They all united to condemn radicals uh, heading off to Iraq and joining this terror group. It's clearly, well, arguably, not going to be enough to, to stop others uh, doing it, but uh, Nick Cater, nonetheless, it was a, a fairly welcome sign, wasn't it, that at least these Islamic leaders were prepared to very publicly state their position on this and show support for the government working together to try and send a message. Yeah, I thought it was very encouraging. Um, and the sort of clear signals we were getting are the sort of signals we, we probably would have needed before. And there is a real problem here because we saw with Bosnia how that became a, a hotbed for sort of mm. recruiting um, is, is, Islamicist um, uh, uh, activists not just here uh, but more so in the United Kingdom so we do have to nip this in the bud and, and 
I think the government seems to be taking this pretty seriously, uh, as it should, uh, and seems to be doing all it can within, within the bounds of the law uh, to, to try and prevent people coming back. The, well, the people, the young men who are from the, the suburbs of Sydney and Melbourne, um, most likely to be doing, to be uh, heading over there and joining up, they may not be the ones who are going to the Friday prayers in the big mosques that these imams represent. It may be the prayer hall, uh, smaller gatherings that, uh, that that should be targeted. But it, it's yeah. very hard to, uh, to 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 stop people becoming radicalised. And, like and this is the problem: and, and increasing uh, attention on the internet mm -hmm. and the radicalisation that goes on there. I mean, in a way, you know, you're right. The people who are, are going overseas are not likely to be the you know the people that are going along with their the mum and dad to the mosque. Um, and you know, we see this with the group Hisbet Taria which was in the mm. in the news for, for other reasons I mean they're, they're all in favor of people going and they work outside the traditional uh, uh, system of mosques I mean, so is, there, yes. is there any way of reaching them and and, and dissuading them I, I, it seems to me that the, the best thing that you can do at this stage is to look at using all the instruments in, in your power to identify uh, who the individuals are and then try and stop them coming back to take the passports off if it's possible to do that. It seems to me that's the most the most you can do because um, you know it's like any sort of sub movement once you sort of send out um, the signals through official channels in a way it can just make people even more determined to go and do the radical thing. Well this is the difficult thing isn't it? Stopping those radicals getting back into the country and you mentioned they're cancelling the passport. Well Yes, that can happen, but if they're an Australian citizen, they'll still be able to get back into the country uh, eventually. So what, what, can you, uh, what you can you do here to, I guess, stop them at the border when they get back in and, and lock them up? Well, uh, if they're, a, if they're a, a dual passport holder, um, uh, two nations, uh, you can cancel a passport. Uh, if they're an Australian citizen and not a citizen of another country, you can still cancel their passport. But, uh, it's not taking away their citizenship. But if they're only an Australian citizen, citizen, they can still get back in. Well, you, you can still cancel their, their, their passport. Sure, uh, sure. That's, you... that's, that's still an option. Yeah, but, but that's not going to stop them getting back to Australia. But, but, if, they, but if they do get back to Australia, it's, it's important that uh, our uh, intelligence agencies have the capacity capacity uh, to determine if they have broken the law overseas and if they have, uh, that they then have the ability to prosecute them uh, in Australia. And this is the hard part, isn't it? Because, um, Cass, while those who post YouTube videos of themselves uh, boasting about the horrendous things they've been doing there, sure, that may well be admissible evidence. But for those who don't um, post stupid videos online, how do intelligence agencies possibly get evidence that they've been up to no good? Well, I think that's a very pertinent question at the moment with the parliamentary review of ASIO and terror anti-terrorism powers coming up. And um, while on the one hand I think I'd agree with everyone here that I think young people in Australia need to be raised to cherish our freedoms and mm. democratic institutions and there, there's definitely a role for stronger civics education and stronger role for supporting Australian values. We've got to keep in mind 150 people is about one bus full, so one Bondi bus full of people is not what I would consider changing some fundamental democratic protections in Australian law for. So for instance, um, it's, it still sounds like a lot to me, though. Well, I mean, if you had a hundred, even a hundred of these young men return to Australia at some keep point. Keep in mind, though, at the moment, ASIO, under the, under the laws that were passed after 9-11, ASIO already have powers for detention without charge. They already have for, powers for... questioning, for, for, but that's only for a set period. And you've got to have some evidence. That's, that's the problem. Yes, I see this, the, <laughs> um, the Australian newspaper today reported that uh, you could have the Australian police actually sent over to try and gather evidence. I mean, is that... Why, though? Why would how, you... How are Australian police going to wander around a battlefield in Iraq gathering evidence on Australians up to no good? Again, there's 40,000 assaults in New South Wales alone every year. You're really going to put the life of police officers at risk, sending them overseas to chase their tails, trying mm. to track down terrorists in the middle of a civil war. <laughs> I, mean, I think we need to keep things in perspective. Mm. There's a busload of people who, God willing, will not come back from those places. And 
if they do, will have seen the error of their ways. But overstating the size of this problem well, I, in I, order no, to I, push I, through <laughs> and, you know, additional powers for ASIO that already, you know, senior legal professor George Williams and others in this field have been arguing for years that those ASIO powers should sunset in 2016 as they were intended to. We now have proposals for metadata, for <laughs> increased powers. I just think I'm not saying there's no problem, but we need to be careful overstating the problem because there are civil rights at stake. Well, Nick Champion, do you think it's a significant number of, of Australians who are apparently involved in this? And, and how do you think it should be tackled? Well, first of all, um, we'll cooperate sensibly with the government to have sensible laws that protect Australians um, from acts of terror. Uh, and it doesn't really matter what inspires that act of terror. Um, there are pot potentially catastrophic um, uh, outcomes, so you need to be uh, cautious and careful and give uh, appropriate powers with appropriate safeguards um, to our national security uh, uh, institutions to make sure that you know the worst doesn't happen. It just seems to me that that's, that's a prudent way of going about things. Um, for a long time now um, we've had people uh, radicalising um, uh, you know, based around utopian visions mm. of how a society might be, and we see the latest is ISIS de declaring and themselves. This situation a in Iraq that seems and, to have know, given, uh, and, given a lot of momentum. And, to that. and I think we have to be careful um, because in Syria and Iraq, we now, I think, are seeing a very serious uh, sectarian divide mm. in those um, in those countries, which is fueling some of this radicalism. So we have to be very, very cautious, um, and you know, a lot of these individuals are just self-radicalising um, via the internet, um, or garage moths, or uh, charismatics individuals leading small groups, um, or just sometimes, you know, um, young men and women making their way from the suburbs. Not always from, uh, uh, you know, traditional Islamic yeah. families. Sometimes, um, you know. They're from, uh, uh, have had, yep. you know, they're white and Anglo Saxon, Catholic, uh, whatever. So we just have to be very, very careful of that phenomenon. Um, we have to have sensible laws which guard against them returning uh, after they've committed crimes in other countries, All crimes right. in Australian <laughs> laws. Uh, those, that, that's a criminal matter that needs to be dealt with by the police. I don't think we should second guess them. And do you think the. Um Nick Cater, finally, do you, do you think the sort of ideas that are being discussed at the moment are sensible approaches to, to dealing with this when it comes well, to strengthening our I haven't seen anything that's gone too over the top, but I, I, I'm in full agreement with Cass on this. I do think that you do need to be very careful about giving extra powers, you know, forever. Uh, and, and the sunset clause uh, is something that should be considered. I'd be very surprised if, if they don't have already enough powers to do the kind of surveillance they want to do. And I would have thought at this stage that is the crucial thing. We're going to have to wrap it up there. But uh, Mitch Feifelt, Nick Cater, Cass Wilkinson and Nick Champion, thank you all very much for joining us. Thanks for your company as well. We'll see you same time next week. Bye for now.